for this morning. Um, I'm joined today by uh, David Novicki from Irvana uh, and also from Don Troshinsky from Acme Packet, uh, technical director. Uh, and there will be a third panelist uh, joining in about 15 minutes. He's just finishing off a previous session, uh, Barlow Keener, who's got a lot of insight into the telecoms aspects of femtocells and has himself moderated many femtocell panel sessions in the past. So the format uh, today is I'll just give a very quick five-minute intro into what a femtocell is, just a recap of the state of the market. Um, and then Dave and Dan and Barlow will each give a, a short 10-minute insight from their company's perspective and after that, we'll throw it open to the floor. So during the panel sessions, the panel presentations, if you can maybe make a note of any questions you'd like to ask, and then hopefully we'll have a good interactive session going through to about 11.15. So just to remind you, what is a femtocell anyway? Femtocell is about the size of a, a paperback book um, or a Wi-Fi access point. Um, but it's got all the functionality that you'll find in a, a full-size mobile phone base station, you know, cell tower. It's just operating at much, much lower power. And it connects to the mobile network through the customer's own broadband link. So that's typically their cable modem or their DSL line. But it could be in an office environment through whatever IP broadband they have. And although they're quite low power, within the coverage area, say around 30 to 50 meters, you get absolutely excellent coverage. Five bars, you get really good voice quality, and you get very high data rates, you know, almost as high as the, the theoretical capacity. Um, and the other great thing is they work with your existing 2G or 3G phone, depending on the type of femtocell. So one of the arguments is that rather than having to limit yourself to a particular type of, say, a Wi-Fi capable handset, or a UMA-capable handset. It just works with what you have today. Three particular problems that they address. One is coverage. So in a large geographic country, you know, like, like the US, where there is wireline DSL or wireline broadband cable available, there may not be good coverage everywhere because it's too expensive to put large towers like that in every neighborhood. So by installing one of these boxes in your home, it solves any coverage black spots. Uh, the second problem that it solves is capacity. It's one of the fundamental principles of radio transmission is that within a cell, you can only transmit so many bits. And we can go to 4G, we can improve the number of bits, we can use all sorts of spatial diversity techniques to, to maybe increase it from uh, the 3G to 4G you know, by three times or five times, or you could say more. But by deploying very, very small cells, you're talking about you know, 100 times or 1,000 times more capacity. And the third area is really around applications, where there's some quite innovative ideas being promoted, that your phone becomes aware that it's in your house, in your own femtocell space, or femtozone as it's called, and it can do things differently. And that might mean something as simple as just presenting a different menu screen, as has been demonstrated by some companies, um, having events that are triggered as you, you come home, um, or different charging uh, and billing principles. In terms of the state of the market, forecast for this year is something around 200,000 units would be shipped worldwide. Uh, I've seen some analysts forecast that perhaps 50% of the market, certainly in the early years, is going to be in North America because you have the fundamental things of pretty poor coverage, <laughs> really good wireline broadband, and a reasonable amount of money. Um, but the whole industry is geared up for quite a significant volume of growth. Now, 12 million may not seem a large number when you compare it to the 4 billion mobile phone users in the world and handsets, but it's a huge number when you compare it with the 4 million cell sites that are installed worldwide today. So that's a total number of towers in the world. 
we could well have more femtocells than cell towers in about 18 months. Progress has been uh, good. The 3G PP Standards Committee has got femtocell standards for, for both 2G and 3G systems, and the 3G PP2 Committee also has made significant progress in a, a CDMA standard, which uh, I think might be discussed by later speakers. And the LTE standard that's been generated and developed by 3GPP also includes the femto cells almost from the ground up, so it's not being added on, and that means that uh, as an integral part of the standard, the whole thing will work a lot better. In terms of geography, as I've said, I think North America is going to be the most, um, the, the highest volume and the quickest take up. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of interest in Europe. It's available today in, in the UK, for example. I can go and buy one, and I have. Um, we've seen SoftBank and other operators in Japan very interested, and many other parts of the, the world are actively running trials today. And the last point I'd like to make is, is partly because we're at a 4G wireless evolution conference, one of the interesting things to me is that the latest 3G CDMA femto cells, and it just so happens that my next speaker has a product that does exactly this, um, is compatible with the IMS core network. So by deploying 3G CDMA femto cells today with an IMS core network, it prepares the operator for their evolution to 4G because they'll have that core network in place and will already have tried out many of the services. And so when LTE comes along, it'll just mean it works faster, lower latency, and so forth. So with that quick um, roundup of the state of the market, I'll hand over to, to Dave. Great. Thanks, David. Okay, so uh, my name is Dave Nowicki, and I'm uh, with Airvana. Uh, just very quickly, uh, Airvana has been in business since the year 2000. Um, we, we've been a mobile broadband company from the very beginning, uh, starting out with macro base stations and RNC controllers and so forth, selling them through the likes of Nortel and Ericsson. Uh, and and uh, about four or five years ago, started getting involved in FMC uh, with security gateways and with uh, the, the most recent product being um, femtocells. So we sell femtocells both on the CDMA side as well as uh, on the UMTS side, uh, evolving toward, uh, toward 4G. The way that David asked us to, to prepare this was really to cover a series of topics um, that can we can go into more detail during the Q&A session. So I'm just going to cover some things that might be interesting to, to talk about uh, later. Uh, but it really is more of a series of topics rather than sort of a, an argument for, for one thing or another. Um, the first is if we think about being at a 4G evolution conference, it's interesting to think about how 4G has evolved uh, from previous generations. And I quite liked the, uh, this morning's presentation. Um, I thought that uh, the speaker's uh, comments, Brow Turner, were, 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 were quite uh, you know, right on in a number of areas. One was having to do with uh, evolution of generations, how long that takes, um, the steps that you have to take along the way, and so forth. I thought those were very good comments. Um, I think that we've got into a point with uh, spectral efficiency of diminishing returns as we're going from 3G to 4G. And I think that, as the speaker mentioned, a lot of the benefits that are coming from 4G have to do with exploring new domains. So the most important domain to explore is the spatial domain. Um, and Brow Turner was talking all about smart antennas uh, being a core component of 4G and being something that's incredibly important to see those spectral efficiency gains over time. And I, and I agree with that um, entirely. Now, having said that, uh, it's interesting to note that smart antennas are something you could do in 3G or in 2G as well. Um, it, I, I personally had deployed a, a lot of smart antennas in 2G a long time ago in Japan. Um, but uh, so, so the spatial domain can be layered across any, any, any generation, but there's no question that it's going to be very popular in the 4G space and, and you know, getting as much spectral efficiency as you possibly can. Um, so the point is that 
when you look toward uh, future generations, you have to bring in the spatial domain. The first way to bring in the spatial domain is smart antennas. The second way to bring it in is femtocells. Um, and femtocells are effectively smaller cells, so you're dividing things up into a, a, a smaller section, and you're basically, as a consumer or as an enterprise, you're owning that piece of, uh, of spectrum. Uh, it's all yours. Uh, you're not sharing it with anybody else. Um, and you, you, know, you can get to very high levels of coverage and capacity and so forth. Um, so that's a nice thing to be thinking about, as, as, uh, as David mentioned. And it's basically, um, as you add more femtocells to the network, you get more capacity. It's that straightforward. Uh, it's, a, it's a very linear relationship. Um, it's the first time when you're adding base stations that you're, you're actually adding capacity as you're adding those base stations. Next thing I want to mention is the Femto Forum, because I think that the Femto Forum has actually um, uh, addressed um, a whole bunch of issues uh, that, that were uh, holding back you know, the industry early on um, through a, a lot of collaboration amongst more than 100 companies. Um, the Femto Forum has, has really gone a long way um, towards addressing issues around uh, market development, uh, technical deployment issues, um, standards, and so forth. And so it's been a remarkable amount of cooperation that's happened within the industry um, and we've seen, as David mentioned, standards in 3GPP and also PP2 evolving quite nicely. You'll see products uh, that support those standards, um, uh, all, you know, available today, uh, but, but probably more of them will be available in the 2010 uh, time frame. But uh, a lot of the products that are on the market today can, can evolve quickly to those standard-based products. But what it effectively means is that uh, somebody with a particular core uh, could hook up, um, you know, two, three, four different femtocell vendors to that, uh, to that core network. And I think that's very important uh, uh, progress that's been made uh, going forward. But the Femto Forum has, has sponsored a number of different things, not only standards, but also some things in the, uh, in the market development area. One of the most important things in the market development area has been the business case. A lot of people say, what's the purpose of the femtocell? How does the operator make money? Um, and what does the consumer get out of it? Um, so so th th those issues have been explored in great detail, actually, um, through an effort uh, that the Femto Forum commissioned with Signals Research Group um, to look at the business case in, in great detail. And there's actually an 80-page white paper, if, you're, if you care to read it, um, available on the Femto Forum website that details all of this. Um, the key findings are, are basically, um, as you see here in the screen, um, it uses a very popular... Um, marketing present value method where you look at the what's called CLV, you look at the customer lifetime value. So you basically say, what's the present value of a customer? Um, I have to pay some money up front to acquire that customer. I get paid every month by that customer. And then every couple of years, I need to effectively uh, upgrade their device and so forth. So I have these costs. I get these revenues. What's the present value, the lifetime of the customer being? How long does it take them for them to churn off the network? So CLV is a very common way that operators use to look at uh, their business. And so what you can do with anything, uh, in this case femtocells, is you can basically say, what did my business look like before uh, I had a femtocell, which is right here, and then what did it look like after I got the femtocell? So this is a traditional waterfall chart, um, which basically details each and every benefit possible through the femtocell. Okay, so we start off at about 1,600 euros. This is a case of a family in Europe. It's a, it's a segment of the market that's paying a certain amount per month. It's an average family. Um, two people, the, 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 the parents are on one particular operator, but the kids are not yet on that operator, and they're trying to recruit everybody onto the same femto in the same family. So what happens is it starts at 1,600 euros, and effectively, that's the present value of the, of the customer today, of that average customer in this particular market segment. And then what we do is we first uh, value destruct here. We, we add the femtocell. We go down um, because we've added about $400, uh, you know, in euro terms here. Uh, to the, to the, you, you might say, well, where does the $400 come from? Well, it's $200 for the femto itself, but then there's $200 of other costs. What costs are they? Well, it's the marketing costs of selling the femto. It's the cost of the centralized platforms. It's the cost of upgrading the femto every three years. What's the present value of that? Uh, it's the upfront billing and provisioning. It's all those extra things that come with actually integrating it in. But you can see in the lifetime of the customer, that cost does not a big part of the overall picture. 
Um, the next thing that happens is uh, you save some money because of offloading the network. And the money that you save is proportional to how much data that you're using. Um, and in this sense, this is a, an average family that has uh, just phones and so forth. They don't have a data card or anything like that, so they're not using that much data. So the savings are not huge in this particular case. You'll see in the next case that they are. Um, the family uses more data, so that effectively means that there's a cost to using that more data on the network. Um, and then there is this uh, option here where you can either have a free calling plan or you cannot have a free calling plan. Um, in this case, we chose to have a free calling plan, similar to what Sprint has done uh, in the United States. And they charge for that free calling plan. Basically, it means nationwide, uh, I'm, I'm going to charge a certain amount of money. In the case of Sprint, it's $10 a month. You get free calls. So that is the present value there. And then there is the monthly fee. They also charge $5 a month for coverage itself. So that's the present value of that. And then there's the reduction in churn. It's been seen in a lot of FMC systems like T-Mobile's Hotspot at Home, Orange's uh, unique product, and so forth, that churn has gone down dramatically as a result of bundling services together and so forth. The femtocell is seen to have the similar sort of benefit. So what you see is going from 1,600 euros to about 2,600 euros in terms of the customer lifetime value. So a lot of value has been created for this one particular segment. Now we have some things out here called enhanced. Um, one thing is adding a family member. This means effectively that you would be recruiting other people in the family. There's a certain probability those people exist, a certain probability that they'll be converted, and effectively that's the value of adding uh, and, and, and lowering your acquisition costs. In addition to this, that there are these femtozone services that David talked about, um, where additional services that you could subscribe to. Um, here are services that you're going to do as a result of uh, having better coverage in your home. These are things you didn't sign up for before, but now you're going to sign up for them as a result of having deep coverage in your home. Um, and then there are the converged operators that have other businesses where they're going to save on churn reduction for those other businesses. So when you add in all these benefits as well, it goes now up to you know, more than doubling the original starting point. So it's a pretty good business case um, for, uh, for, for the operator. And you'll, you'll see that um, this is consistent across 16 or so different scenarios that are looked at in the paper. Um, there's, a big, there's a model that's available to, to put in your particular parameters. Let me show you one more case. Um, the next case is the heavy data user. This is the user that uh, Brow Turner was talking about in his mobile broadband talk. Um, this is the user that uses gigabytes of data on a mobile data card, very common. Um, in this case, what happens is the main, the, 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 uh, the, the user is actually worth less to start with because they use so much traffic. A mobile data card user is much more costly to an operator than a, than a regular voice user. Um, and, and so the starting value is actually lower, so the cost of the femtocell actually looks a lot more pronounced on this particular chart. However, immediately, all the network cost savings make it such that you get that back from the very beginning. So theoretically, the operator could give away the femtocell and immediately be saving the costs uh, up front and not need to charge anything for it. And some uh, operators, T-Mobile is a good example in, in Germany, they've actually taken the strategy where they're going after heavy data users with the femtocell to try to get them to offload off the network, and that is something that they're using uh, to create more capacity on their network. And this is one of the reasons why they might want to do that. Churn reduction um, is, of course, still prevalent uh, in the mobile broadband case. And so you can see that just with these two benefits, there's a positive business case. We first went down here, uh, then we went back up here, then we went up here to get to here. Um, so you can see there's a positive business case for the mobile broadband user as well. This is what the 4G case would look like. Uh, because the 4G case, in many respects, uh, for femtocells is effectively this case here. The last thing I wanted to mention is just the, 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 the play of complementary uh, mobile broadband versus fixed mobile broadband. There's a lot of people in the room, I think, that are proponents of Wi-Fi. I, I, I picked that up from the, uh, from the earlier uh, talk at 8.30 this morning. Um, and I think that one of the questions that's often asked about 4G and femtocells is the question of, well, with 4G and femtocells, isn't it really a mobile broadband play? And so how much data is somebody really using in their house? 
how much data are they actually using in their house. Um, it turns out if you look at the data in the 3G space, about 50% of, of mobile data traffic is actually used in the house. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, why are people doing that? Um, you know, what, why are they using uh, mobile broadband versus fixed broadband? There's a bunch of reasons for that. But you also have to ask yourself, um, those mobile broadband users that are using data in their, in their home, are they doing it um, as a substitute for fixed broadband or are they doing it as a complement for fixed broadband? Do they have both services? Do they have mobile and fixed together? Are they going to continue that model? Because the femtocell needs that broadband connection. The femtocell is going to need that broadband connection in the first place. So as it turns out, this is some data from Analysis Mason. And this is a European outfit uh, that, that looked at this. And what they basically found was that two-thirds of the market in, 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 this, in this example is Europe um, are actually people that are, were using mobile broadband in a complementary sense. Two-thirds of the market were using it from a complementary perspective. One-third was using it as a substitute. So the vast majority of the market is, in fact, using mobile broadband and fixed which furthers the business case to put a femtocell into the mobile broadband 4G era and offload that traffic and, and make the business case for the operator. So these are some more things we could talk about in the Q&A section. Uh, these are common things that are talked about in the industry. One is cost. Uh, another one is the compatibility. Another one is interference. Is there going to be interference with the macro network? Another one is health. You know, as it turns out, femtocells are basically transmitting the same uh, or lower power levels as things like Wi-Fi and cordless telephones and so forth. So it's all sort of w in this same class of, of products. Uh, but this is an issue that comes up because people immediately think, oh, it's a large macro cell that's being condensed into my home. So what does that mean, right? Uh, and, and, and so that's an issue that definitely, uh, uh, you know, can be very pronounced in places like France and, and other places where, where these issues are, are, are much, you know, much, much uh, keener. Um, but it's something we could talk about in the Q&A. And um, I already talked a little bit about the operator business case. We could talk about the consumer business case. And then in terms of product readiness, lots of vendors, uh, lots of operators doing femtocells, lots of test equipment and so forth uh, is, is in place. A lot of companies that are, uh, that are lined up and ready to go. So it, it really is a market that is, is just emerging now. There are four operators that have commercial networks in place and, and, and many more to come. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Dave. So hopefully uh, you've made a note of a few questions you can ask Dave a little bit later on. But meanwhile, I'd like to introduce uh, Don Trushinsky from Acme Packet. Technical director will be covering some of the uh, core network issues and security aspects. Excellent, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I can even validate some of that data. It's fascinating because, uh, just anecdotally, I've had my femtocell in my home for uh, a year at least, I guess. Pre market trials, I was able to get one. And truly, I'm, uh, I'm offloading the macro. There's a business case uh, for customer retention. Um, I'm, sa I'm certainly saving the operator's cost. Uh, Certainly trying to get my wife onto my plan so she can use the phone. So it's, it's just fascinating. It's I'm almost uh, modeled by that chart, so it's very valid data. Um, I was asked to talk a little more about the architectural uh, questions or issues behind uh, the femto cell. And so now you're going to go from you know the user experience and, and market data into the network. And, um, and that's because Acme Packet, uh, specifically, we provide a component of the femto cell solution. Uh, uh, we focus on uh, IMS elements specifically um, and also uh, the security gateway component. So uh, I'll, I'll be uh, talking about the technology a little bit further into the network. Um, I can't paint quite such a rosy picture on the standards front. Um, certainly IUH and the FEMTA forum and 3GPP uh, uh, really was able to, uh, to move forward with a, a standard that, um, you know, that, that works with the 2G and 3G networks. Um, I think the uh, IMS and 4G, which is really the topic of this confer uh, conference, is, um, is a little bit up, uh, up in question. There's a lot of activity in 3GPP even this week on the subject. Uh, there are no less than seven proposals out there. Um, and, uh, and certainly uh, the question of uh, where you integrate with the IMS uh, uh, network is, is, uh, is still somewhat in question. But uh, what I'll be talking about is, you know, why would you even um, – uh, use a SIP-based uh, femtocell, um, and uh, some of the, some of the, uh, I guess the advantages uh, of an IMS or SIP-oriented femtocell 
architecturally would be, you know, you're going beyond that uh, uh, release 99 phone. You can realize some of the new services in uh, in the home and, and have that awareness um, and potentially different user experience when you're in the home. Uh, video doorbell, for example, would be one. And uh, and so really you can see new or uh, innovative services uh, with, a, with a more IMS-oriented femto cell. Uh, certainly the operators that are looking towards IMS uh, for their femto or technology are, are looking to reduce the load on the MSCs. Um, really you can take more of a, an MSC-oriented approach or you can take an IMS-oriented approach uh, architecturally uh, in, uh, in the femto cell uh, deployment. And, uh, and really that probably depends upon how much you'd like to offload uh, from the existing MSCs. Certainly you can reduce your uh, dependency on some of the application-specific gateways that are required uh, when you uh, use the legacy technologies and, uh, and leverage the existing, uh, potentially existing IMS network that's out there. So uh, you know, Femto's potentially represent an uh, early ROI for the uh, IMS evolution. Uh, so architecturally, uh, with SIP, uh, of course, comes the need for control of that SIP. Um, you look into the network, uh, we've seen uh, uh, some of the IP address uh, challenges. Um, there's a lot of activity going on in the uh, in the fixed broadband market to uh, uh, to uh, evolve to support uh, more addresses, and uh, certainly that can create an architectural challenge. You may find yourself with uh, uh, the need to do uh, IPv6, for example, in the access network. Uh, signal and control interworking certainly is a challenge architecturally. Uh, service element overloads. Um, Regulatory, I think we've got uh, panelists with expertise there. Uh, certainly DOS attacks. Now you're looking at, uh, at bringing a whole new access infrastructure into your, um, you know, your IMS core, your, your uh, MSC, and uh, certainly you're opening yourself up to, uh, to attack. So uh, latency is certainly uh, always a case, uh, especially in the 4G context. Uh, signaling, transport protocol, incompatibilities um, certainly can be addressed architecturally. Um, if you look inside the box there in the middle of the uh, diagram, I think you've got kind of a combination of these. As I mentioned, there are about seven options out there for uh, IMS-centric or um, uh, MSC-centric uh, Femto um, solutions, if you will, or standards. Uh, you may have a uh, home node B gateway that's providing you compatibility uh, today for time to market uh, reasons in your architecture, um, and you may find... Uh, uh, some of the uh, inner working much deeper into the network. Um, you can see the uh, home node B um, application server, convergence application server up there within the IMS core. But I think a lot of uh, you know, 3GP is 3GPP is taking the uh, the question seriously and trying to ar uh, address those uh, issues architecturally and kind of come up with a common theme. Let's just say uh, you know, we, we we know that we're going to have this change in access technology. Uh, you know, there will be uh, challenges. Uh, you, you had a private macro uh, RAN, and now you're expanding that across a, a shared infrastructure, right? So that does uh, create uh, security impacts to the mobile network operator. Uh, you could potentially have, uh, you know, the worst case, service interruption, uh, reputation, trust, subscriber uh, churn as a, as a challenge uh, in deploying Femto. So your architecture should take that into account. Uh, worms, and uh, this is a little bit of a build-up slide, but uh, certainly, obviously, the threats of, uh, of an open access network are well known versus that that, uh, that private uh, access network that you see in the RAM. So when you consider the security solution, the components of it, whether or not you're uh, IMS-centric or MSC-centric, uh, certainly there are components of uh, a Femto architecture that should take security into account. apologize for the build-up here, but... Um, uh, so you've got uh, you've got the challenges of uh, of limiting uh, access into uh, your IMS architecture. Uh, you could certainly have uh, SIP or IMS based uh, attacks. Uh, there is still an architectural question as to whether or not that femto cell can be trusted. Uh, you know, we feel that uh, certainly there's um, the ability to validate the network operator, and there's the ability to uh, validate the uh, the femto cell itself. Certificate based technology. Um, Ike authentication techniques, uh, even IMS authentication techniques can be leveraged to say, hey, we put a box in the uh, subscriber's home and we really know it's our box and we really know uh, that they're, uh, that they're uh, authenticating in a valid way. Uh, so we feel, uh, we feel confidently about the, uh, the ability to, to have a trusted femto cell out there. Uh, 
Obviously, uh, pure IP solution, you still have um, the ability to uh, uh, launch additional uh, tunnel attacks against the core network, so uh, features such as uh, Ike, uh, Ike V2 rate limiting and uh, just IPsec encryption decryption are, uh, are key to your architecture. So uh, I think that's what we wanted to talk about today. Uh, hopefully we've uh, at least given you an idea of uh, some of the architectural challenges. Um, it uh, would be a lot longer panel, I think, if we went through them all. So. I'm sure we could spend a full day on that. Exactly. So thanks very much, Don. I'd like to introduce uh, Barlow Kina, who's an expert in telecoms law. Uh, he's very familiar with Fem2Cell. He tells me he's far more run, run many more Fem2Cell panels sessions at conferences than, than, than I have. <laughs> no, no, no. And he's got some insights into some of the technical, sorry, legal implications, which uh, may not be obvious. So um, I wanted to uh, focus a little bit. Let me. If I get this right, yeah. okay. Um, on uh, femtocells, the interesting thing that Don was just talking about is you have this dramatic uh, shift that femtocells are going to, I believe, require. And I, I go along with the case study, uh, but but basically you need to offload all the data that's going to be happening, and, and we're starting to see from the iPhones the data use, especially video, and you know. In particular, kids and teenagers sitting at home watching video on their mobile data uh, on their on their iPhones is going to put a big stress on the network, and it's not going to the the RAN folks are not going to be able to keep up with it. So they need to move to femto cells for that purpose. Um, that's going to create a whole slew of legal regulatory issues that are going to be dealt with. These are just uh, not insurmountable. They're they're just to be known about. Uh, but uh, they, they will occur. You know, right now, uh, a macro tower, uh, which all of you are familiar with, has a barbed wire fence around it, and, uh, you know, you can't get near it. Well, suddenly we're going to deliver the macro tower into the hands of the consumer, and they can do whatever they want with it. They can hack at it. They can, you know, they've got full use of it. They can take it to uh, on vacation with them. Uh, they can take it out of country with them. Uh, so... Um, and when everyone uh, who's not in the tele who has a femto cell here, so two, okay, and panelists, <laughs> you don't none of y'all don't count. <laughs> so um, the uh, it, and, and I know Verizon has their extender service, but w usually when you talk to someone about femto cells, you say, well, it's so I can get service at home where I don't have it. They go, great, I'll take it to Vermont with me because I can't get service there. That's what the consumer thinks. Um, but they may think they can't get service in their basement, but taking it to Vermont is what I'm going to address, some of those issues. Uh, there's no, really no regulation of femto cells. Uh, in the, I'm speaking mostly for the U.S. Um, because usually regulation lags behind the use of a service, which is normal. Uh, the problems arise, and then they get regulated. Um, so uh, there's the first mention of femto cell is in a document uh, by the FCC in February 2008, where they talk about air rave products. But that's pretty much it. They mention the trials of Pico cells in airplanes. Um, there's going to be this issue that will arise. Uh, uh, VoIP is very heavily, if you know about regulation, is heavily regulated uh, by the FCC. And it's not just free. You can do what you want with it. There's 911 regulation. There's USF charges. Uh, uh, there, uh, you know, network neutrality plays a little bit of a role. You can't really uh, block uh, a VoIP call if you're a wireline carrier. A uh, femto cell looks a whole lot like VoIP service. So, it, but wire, wireless is also highly regulated. There are rules for 911, the wireless carriers. It's been highly regulated for years. It you know, is this service, is it a wireless call? Is it a, is it a VoIP call? Where is that going to fall out when the FCC takes a look at this? They're, they're going to say, is this, does this fall under the VoIP regulations? Or does this fall under the wireless regulations? I mean, we all might say it's wireless, there's no, there's no question, but when you take a look at it, especially if you start g g getting some of the smaller uh, revolutionary, I'll call them, uh, wireless companies that are using VoIP in odd ways, they begin to look like uh, a VoIP company. I mean, uh, wireless carriers, they begin to look like VoIP companies. So um, the 
uh, interconnected VoIP service as a definition. You know, it requires a broadband connection from the user's location. If you read that definition, um, it permits the user to receive and terminate calls to the, on the, to the public switch telephone network. Uh, this service, the definition of, that the FCC has, uh, begins to make uh, femtocell usage look like VoIP service. It's hard to tell the difference. Uh, 911. Um, the, uh, there are 140,000 uh, 911 calls, really more than that now, uh, made every day in the U.S. from wireless phones. Um, so femto cells are, uh, present an interesting challenge in that um, right now when you make a call from a wireless phone, you can triangulate or you can use the phone's GPS uh, to determine uh, where uh, the caller is calling from. Uh, that regulation is in evolution with the FCC. It's not really completely tied down. There's not, it hasn't come to the point where there's, you have to have a GPS device in your cell phone. Uh, with a femto cell, it, it, you don't know where the antenna is, so it's much harder to, uh, it, it could be in someone's home, it could be, you just don't know where it is. And if you're on that femto cell, it's going to be much more difficult, not impossible, to uh, determine uh, where the caller is calling from. Uh, you might say, well, the femto cell has a GPS chip in it, and that's going to eliminate the problem. Well, if you turn it on in this building, uh, the, the, the cell won't know where it is because it can't get to the satellite. Um, so there, there's some workarounds, but this is going to be an issue. Um, this is kind of a, an issue that most of the network folks don't want to talk about, uh, which is billing issues, but most everyone in here is familiar with the class action suits. Oh, yeah, there was a, you know, a $500 million, you know, settlement by Verizon Wireless to pay for text messages that they said, and you see the class action. That can wipe out a lot of profits early on um, that were all the work went into. Uh, but you're going to have roaming uh, issues. Uh, and the roaming issues are kind of interesting. There are 95 cellular uh, companies in the U.S. that are facilities-based. And everyone says, well, there should only be three or four. Uh, those companies uh, that are small, they could take uh, a, a femtocell and let's just say you're an Iowa company, um, and one of your users could take that femtocell to New York City. There's no requirement that the femtocell be locked or that it have GPS. There's no regulation. And other users in New York City could end up on that femtocell, and all the minutes that go through that femtocell would be considered roaming. And so the carrier that is normally located in New York would be paying roaming charges to the carrier in Iowa because that's the way the call would be would be made. Um, this is just a issue which is addressed by Acme Packet a little bit, but um, this is where you have the femto cell at home. Uh, that uh, ugly monster at the top is a parasite. Uh, a lot of people call vo uh, Vonage parasitic VoIP because they're using somebody else's DSL to get to the internet. They're not paying. For, Vonage is not paying for it. So all of a sudden, the wireless carriers are going to be the same parasite that Vonage is. And uh, they're going to be dependent on the home network being correctly configured. Um, so there is the chance that it could be blocked. Uh, so you might have uh, blocking, just like peer-to-peer -peer blocking. That's a network neutrality issue. And uh, those VoIP calls will be subject to deep packet inspection by the wireline carrier. Um, so with IPsec, you might eliminate that, or you, you may or may not eliminate that. But it does raise new issues that, that, they ha that have not been addressed by the wireless carriers to date. So that's the uh, end of my session, and look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Barlo. I think there were a few uh, extra issues and certainly some new points that I hadn't seen before on that. Um, hopefully the uh, talks that you've just heard have stimulated a few burning questions. I can see a few hands ready to go up. So, um, yes, gentlemen at the, at the back there. Sorry, could you just speak up a little bit? Sorry. We can't quite hear you. I, I signed up for the Sprint Air Rates. 
Yep. And I've been very impressed not only with the, the quality of the service, but also it seems like they're really taking the reg regulatory side pretty seriously. I, uh, so I, my base station is in, in Dallas, and I'm right on the fringe coverage for spring, and it really improved the coverage significantly. I'm, I'm getting uh, 2,000 feet outside my house, and I can check that I'm still on the, the area. But then I said, okay, I'm going to take up to my cottage in the Adirondacks in upstate New York. And, uh, and, and by the way, I could not connect it to the that was in the first place until the GPS took like three hours for it to really walk on and that sort of thing. I took it up to the Adirondacks, which was outside the spring cover zone. My town wasn't the town next door was. And they, uh, they denied the service. So they, they actually they used the GPS signal. And I called them and they said, So that's so that's a good comment. Um, does anybody have any questions for the panel? I, I, I'll follow up the comment though. Um, uh, Sprint is a is a big carrier. There are four or five big carriers. Uh, they're going to make sure that those uh, cells are locked to the extent that they can, and they will be. But uh, you've got other carriers both here uh, in the U.S. and outside the U.S. that there's nothing to prevent someone from uh, Bangladesh or from Malaysia from bringing their femtocell to the U.S. And, and all of a sudden you might be uh, a user for Verizon and you might have a huge international uh, call showing up on your bill. That's, that, that could easily happen. One, one, sorry. One, one just additional comment. Uh, I, I, I also use the Sprint uh, Airwave. Um, and I think that the way that it works is that you can actually take it to a different location so long as Sprint owns Spectrum in that particular area. Um, but if you go somewhere where they don't own the Spectrum, then that's what the FCC, you know, th th then, then effectively that's when they're going to tell you you can't use it because we don't own Spectrum there. Um, so it's it's... For moving it about, it'll be good for a hole in the coverage where they're supposed to have coverage, right? Uh, but not necessarily into some brand new territory, um, as you're as you're envisioning. Yeah. So there's legal uh, le le legal implications. Yeah. What, one of the examples that, that was given was um, in Singapore, the operator there, Starhub, uh, launched launched service, and it, and there were some anecdotes of people going traveling abroad, taking a femto cell, plugging in, you know, in a hotel and making calls effectively on their, their home rate. Um, and that worked for a while, but really that is not a good idea because it, it does interfere with the, the other networks in the area. So, so the way they block it is that they look at the IP address that the Femto cell is coming in on, and they can tell if it's out of the country, and they just block that. So there are a variety of ways, including sniffing for other cell sites and their identities that, that can be used as well. I think we've got a question from the front. Uh, yes, I have a question about, uh, Wade, you mentioned that white paper about yes. uh, different trends that they saw. Uh, one thing you mentioned that two-thirds of people that use mobile broadband today, they use it as a complement to yes. face wireless. But I'm just thinking that's just because we're early in the evolution, right? Just like when we were connecting to Internet first, a lot of people kept their fixed phone and they also had like mobile phone, right? Mm -hmm. Now a lot of people are letting go of their fixed phone because they're trusting more on the mobile phone. So eventually that two-thirds number is going to go down. So we're going to have probably less broad, I mean we can't depend on fixed broadband as much as we want to. So that's going to create some issues with that Fento cell model. Oh, the, the, I mean, I guess a couple of things. The, the data that was presented there, um, you know, was talking about it being a, a, a two-third, one-third case today, but it also projected out to 2014. I mean, we could, we could put it back up. Um, and what it projected out to 2014 was that it was staying uh, pretty much Same consistent, time. yeah, so that it wasn't changing. And one of the reasons that it was this way is that uh, they believe that people will be in more of a position of being able to afford and need both. And one of the ways you do that is on the mobile broadband side, you explore two different things. One is prepaid uh, pricing, which kind of protects you from when you're not using it. And there's also some new innovative pricing schemes where they'll they'll price where you can be paying a certain amount per month, 
but then if you don't use it in one particular month, uh, you're not paying that same amount. But then if you do use it, if you're active, then you pay this uh, you know, larger amount. So there's some innovative techniques that are coming up to, to make mobile broadband uh, that are already being done in Asia and Europe and so forth that just haven't gotten here yet. Um, so that's the first thing about it. It, it looks as though it could be uh, you know, cost effective to have both. Um, but I think that uh, a lot of the mobile broadband, um, the, the reason that a lot of the, the, the traffic is, is, uh, is done indoors just has to do with the simplicity of it all. Um, you know, once you're connected in mobile broadband, you can be connected all the time wherever you are. So it's a very simple thing to be thinking about. In terms of the, the whole idea of relying on just wireless, um, I think that it's different uh, between voice and data a little bit. Uh, you know, I think that you can cut the cord uh, on voice, but you can still have your broadband connection, right? That, that it's possible to do that. A lot of people do do that. Um, and you'll still use your broadband connection for the internet and, 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 and those sorts of things. Um, and it's, I, I've actually heard more recently as well is, is, is some, um, some, some carriers that have both mobile and fixed thinking they might bundle fixed broadband uh, with a femto together as a service to go and sell it to somebody that has only mobile broadband. Uh,